You're listening to The Valley Current. Welcome into The Valley Current. This is the podcast that I've run for the last several years with a view of getting interesting people to talk about what they do and what they're observing in a very complicated world. And I wanted to have you on for many, many months, if not years, and you've been too busy because you make so much money that your time told, is just way too Who told long. you? I'm keeping that quiet. I know. Let's keep it very quiet. Um, I, I tend to think that you're like the mentor to Annie Duke. I don't know if she's related to you, but Annie Duke writes the books that talk about thinking in bets, that sort of thing. And she she's the uh, PhD from Wharton, who does the brain science stuff. Are you related to her at all? Yeah, I'm 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 t- tangentially I'm familiar with her. I sort of I sort of follow that thinking a little bit. So um, I, I know the name, but um, sadly no relation to Annie Duke, but really tragically no relation to Doris Duke. <laughs> so, yeah, then you then you'd really be in the money, right? Tell me where you grew up, because you're in Philadelphia. Uh, well, some would right say now. some would say I haven't, but um, but I was uh, I'm a military brat and born in North Carolina, but migrated to my family sort of South Texas. We can sort of trace our lineage back to any number of trailer parks in and around Brazoria County, Texas, all the way back to, to the 1930s, broadly. You grew up with kind of a, you know, middle class family or working class family like I did, right? You know, it was interestingly, um, I always thought it was middle class. And then I only recently came to understand it was poverty. And um, <laughs> but by the standard that we know it now, but, but it, it, it and it's not just me. I mean, all of my, most of my friends that I still am in touch with, yeah, it was, that's kind of what it was. And I I find it comical that it never entered my mind that I was one of them. And um, you, you probably so, felt pretty, you probably felt pretty rich. It just didn't enter my mind. I, I don't know why it didn't. And all my friends were the same. And, but, you know, I graduated from, uh, you know, Texarkana, Texas. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's impossible to sort of stroll around and think you're anything but not doing very well economically, sort of at the bottom 10% of the ladder, I, I would imagine. But I, at the time, I didn't know. I didn't start doing that kind of work until recently. Uh, my father died in 2007 and happily had the time to think about all of these changes that have happened even in my lifetime. For example, uh, Patricia, you know my my wife, and she mm-hmm. and I went to, um, we did a walkabout through North Carolina. I hadn't been, I hadn't been back to the, the Piedmont in, you know, 50 years. And, and I, I was completely stunned by the fact that there were no tobacco barns anywhere. And I couldn't find anyone other than some older ladies at the Denny's who would remember, who even remembered tobacco barns. So, you know, these are the kind of things that you just, you don't notice how these transitions happen. And then all of a sudden you get old enough to be able to remember, oh, that's right, Time things change. And so, but anyway, that's uh, I graduated from high school in in Texarkana, Texas, and then um, I went to college in, in in around that area. And then you ended up on the East Coast, and what in New York? No, no, I graduated in Texarkana, Texas. Went to went to arguably one of the worst universities in America, East Texas State University at Texarkana, and knew it was one of the worst universities um, because in two thousand and probably six or seven, I was living in London at the time, and I, t- I took a job with the Royal Bank of Canada on their equity trading desk, and they, I had to fill out my university, and it didn't exist anymore. Well, you know, I just I couldn't believe it took them that long to figure it out, but uh, turns out it was bought by Texas A&M, 
And so now it's, if I send uh, Texas A&M 10 bucks, five bucks for the accounting degree and another five for the uh, for the MBA, I got a ten dollar Texas A&M uh, degree set. So, that's worth a, that's worth a lot, man. That's worth a lot. These well, I, you know, when I when I called them and got the address, uh, th they couldn't convince me it was worth ten bucks. So I just never got around to doing it. But anyway, long story short, by two thousand and seven, my industry had gone away. Not that it was even an industry anyway. So I went from two thousand and seven to. Um, I, I guess you could say today, functionally unemployed. But it's not necessarily that I was unemployed. It was more that I was unemployable. I think you're being very humble. You, you know, I'm point. actually I'm actually not. In, in 2008-ish or 2000, and, well, I'll give you the numbers. I'll give you the numbers. I, I went to, I moved to London with Thomas Weisel Partners in 2000 and actually 1999. Uh, Weisel offered me 325000 to start plus a bonus, which ended up to be 100 and some grand. And so that was that was my W-2 income in 2000. And by 2007, Canaccor Genuity in, in New York offered me 100000 for the same job, base salary. And then... By 2008 or nine, some other firm on Fifth Avenue, <laughs> they interviewed me two or three times and they said, hey, listen, we really want you on the team. And they had one of their head guys come over and uh, I was sitting in the office, the second interview with these people. And there were a bunch of sales guys on the desk that I knew. And they said, uh, you know, what they're going to do in the offer and everything. I said, look, is it, is it just me or are you guys not, I'm not hearing any numbers. And they said, well, you know, what we do is we kind of set it up this way. We'll pay you a percentage. I said, You're going to pay me zero. And they said, uh, well, I guess. And, you know, set, and I said, was that the same deal all the other guys got? And he said, yeah. And so you had to earn it based on your your performance. It's, and it's because I had no value. But not only did I not have any value, the company had no value. They had a product that they had a reasonable expectation that no one was going to be able to sell it. So that was the amount of capital they were willing to allocate towards it. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Okay. okay. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll use your personal capital to fund our business. Mm -hmm. And so the cool thing is when I knew that the world had changed forever is when I accepted a job with the offering salary of nothing – and I right. asked the guys, I asked the guys in, uh, I mean, with a straight face, I said, look, let's say you guys get sick of me and want to fire me. How am I going to know? <laughs> what's what's right. the clue going to be? So, but no, no, the job went away. And, and so it's, it's not unique in this new world that we're living in. It's just uh, really difficult for people to understand and truly appreciate that they absolutely don't have any value. And so from that, I was able to ask a simple question. Well, gee, I wonder why I don't have any value. Everywhere I look, I see these people that are in the same predicament. There's this industry called the real estate industry. I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, yep. Yep. Th those people don't have any value. You know, they drive around and they point out, a, there's the kitchen, there's the backyard. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, one industry after another is just getting slaughtered by what uh, I mean. Mark Andreessen was clear when he wrote the the when he wrote that essay in the in the in the Wall Street Journal. Software is software eating the world. But right. guess what? That's what's happening. Which, by the way, you know, you and you and I are here having a conversation about trillionaires, and I am. That income that I used to make is now transferring to other people. So thank goodness I figured it out well, to the extent that I out. have. You, you figured it out, but you also observed lots of things that I'm not sure that AI or software would be able to observe. And I think that still has a lot of value, tremendous amount of value. You don't see it that way? No, I don't. 
Um, I don't see it that way because I don't think that there is uh, I don't think there is any interest, broadly speaking, for this idea set that is so patently obvious to me that it's not even possible to have a conversation about for example, you're not you're not re- going to get anybody to readily admit that they don't necessarily have any value in the in the current marketplace, and um, and and then you ask them why, and then you start to give them one example after another, and and you. My experience is that I run into these walls of of uh, belief sets that. People are simply not willing to. They can't even begin to have a conversation. I mean, you can. I mean, I've, you've seen my emails before. And you're part of a. You're part of a, a robust list of people I send emails to. That's roughly. It, it varies between seven and eight, depending on how pissed off I am at somebody <laughs> on any given day. But I don't. What I do has no value in the marketplace even now, but I don't actually even care because I'm I'm tapped into this wealth transfer that is so unbelievable. It's bigger than anything I've ever seen. So I don't actually even care. You know, as, as you know, we run this wealth management. <laughs> we run this wealth management business, which is absolutely absurd. And I tell everybody – how absurd it is because we only own one stock, actually two stocks now, which is Tesla and NVIDIA. But mainly we just own Tesla. And it's the only stock we're ever going to own. We don't even care about any other stock. Why would we even care? And so, um, and, and so we sort of figured out how this transition happened and why it started accelerating. And that's what I do now. So... Which is why, I mean, for, for example, how is it possible that I can't have a conversation with anybody or find anyone broadly who cares that with the simplest amount of really dead simple math that Elon Musk is about to be a trillionaire by 2028? 2020, and, 2028 is like is like five years faster than my predictions went, but that's that's probably minor it, minor error in my calculation. Well, you can't even you, look. You can't even get to the calculation anymore. And the reason you can't get to the calculation is because there's no way for you to have a reasonable conversation about how you're going to value his equity holdings and SpaceX and what his holdings are going to be in this and. I mean, even if I just look at his Tesla position, even if I just look at his Tesla position, I I, I get to a trillion dollars by 2026 to 2028. But that's not the conversation. That is not the conversation. The conversation is he's going to live for another 38 years. So he's going to be compounding a trillion dollars for 38 years. And he's going to be doing it with his other gang of trillionaires. So we've entered this world in this realm of the trillionaire and not only is no one interested they don't even care they they don't even stop to consider the fact that one man walking around planet earth is going to be worth more than the gdp of russia really soon and so then they're gonna say well gee gee I should, i'm really worried about the russians and their economic power well okay well how about how about Elon Musk? <laughs> Uh, it's going to be worth more than the GDP of Italy, which is two trillion. It's going to be worth more than the GDP of Germany, four point five trillion. I mean, so it's it's unbelievable. There is no marketplace to have a conversation with anyone about that because they simply don't care. Anyway, so I don't care either broadly, but that's that's sort of how the framework that I see the world. Well, there's three Sorry. big points. There's three big no. There's three big points in what you just said. One is that you clearly believe in Tesla and Nvidia, and probably nothing. No, 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 no. I don't believe in. It's it's important to understand that I don't believe in Tesla. I don't even give a shit about Tesla, and I don't give a shit about Nvidia. I could care less. We have moved into the realm of the monopoly. I only care about monopolies. I don't care about anything else other than monopolies because capitalism axiomatically creates monopolies. 
It's what it does. And in a digital world, as we've transitioned from wealth creation from the periodic table of elements to the standard model of particles, there's only one company that can charge nothing for their product. You can't have two companies competing for zero. That's mm. why you have Google at 92% market share in search. <laughs> you, that's, that's why you, that's why, that's why Amazon has, it's not even worth having a conversation about where Amazon's going to be in 10 years or 15 years. It's, it's, it's absurd. So when I say absurd, I mean, stop and think about it. Okay. So, so Amazon web services is one is a hundred billion in revenue of software trades at uh, the software trades at 20 times revenue. Um, hey, if software trades at 20 times revenue, that's $2 trillion just for Amazon web services. And so the company right now is trading at 1.8 trillion. So why am I having a conversation about what stock to buy tomorrow? Right. Um, so, uh, I mean, th these, these stories are so unbelievably simple that, that uh, and they were always simple. They were never not complicated. And, and I, I suppose that's the big revelation that I had in and around 2011 and 2012. So, so would you say, in, in sort of a summary way, would you say you're observing what, say, you might have observed back 100 plus years ago when all these robber barons were in the U.S. controlling railroads like Stanford I mean, eventually did something very kind in establishing Stanford University, but essentially these people that were becoming multimillionaires when the rest of society was pretty much living on $500 or so a year or a month. I mean, it wasn't very much money comparatively speaking, but when the JP Morgans and the rest of the robber barons made their way uh, into the American economy, do you think you're observing that again, except now it's not traditional americans absolutely, absolutely but yeah absolutely but it's at a scale that's unprecedented now and so you know you and i'm sure you have done the uh, tour of newport rhode island and you, you go to uh you take a stroll into um, the Breakers, for example, um, Vanderbilt's summer place, the Breakers, and you walk around and you see this opulence and then you, you know, you do a little Google search and you say, OK, so he finished this when he was 49. He would have known he had 15 years to live as he was building this. So. He probably had a reasonable expectation that generally none of this wealth he was going to take with him. He knew he was going to die in 15 years. So well, what does it even matter what you spend on anything? It doesn't even matter. It's an absurd conversation. And, and so even at that time, that class had transcended wealth. And so now we have reached a point where and I would I would propose that uh, I would propose that Ed Teller, uh, you know, Stan Ulam, Ed Teller, the hydrogen bomb. I, I would mm -hmm. say that he's the one he's the he's the one in 1943 that sort of said, you, you know, you know, there there actually is no known maximum here. There's a maximum with molecules, anything on the periodic table. You've got a known maximum because that stuff's heavy. But, you know, with electrons and photons, there's no known maximum. You can make it as big as you want. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that's what I came to understand around uh, 2011 and 2012. Because a lot of things had to come together. You, you, you know, the iPhone happened, what, June of 2007? But it didn't actually work until, until we had a 4G network. Right. So, uh, you know, in a 4G network... <laughs> So, 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 um, yeah, and, and that's why I am so ambivalent about it. There's just nothing to do. So I harass seven or eight people with my emails in the morning because I read these books and it's just so bloody fascinating. 
um, uh, you know, if you, you stop and think about stop and think about Ron Grin in nineteen in eighteen ninety six. I mean, he discovers the X ray. Okay, well, uh, am, am I to believe that up until up until eighteen ninety six that the world still believed that the sun was operating from wood? Maybe they're burning coal up there. <laughs> I mean that's how fresh these ideas are. So you know, and then and then uh, I just finished the bio of Fritz Haber, and I was telling your partner um, uh, that uh, you know it, it's an amazing story that he is he is arguably connected to every single penny of net <laughs> worth that has been created in since 1908. I mean, he took the cost of a calorie of food to roughly zero which exploded the global population, which population drives GDP. And so here we are having a conversation about uh, the marginal utility of the next $750 billion yacht for Jeff Bezos, which happens to be zero. He's run out of stuff to buy. Well, and you're seeing that reflected in stocks. That's the interesting point. These guys that are going to fast become trillionaires, and I think it is all guys. Maybe there is a woman in the group. I, I don't think you've mentioned anyone that's a woman so far. But basically, these guys, they couldn't really spend the money in their remaining lifetime if they wanted to, right? But there's nothing to buy. Well, they'd have to buy, they'd, have to, they'd have to buy like a country and create their own nation if you have that so, kind of money, right? So let's let's think about let's think about the scale and the speed of this. In, two, in 1995, Jeff Bezos was the richest man in the world. At in 1995, it was a big not Bezos, sorry, Gates. Gates, Gates. richest right. man in the world. 1995, the number was something like 12.9 billion dollars. Okay, right. um, Paul Allen sold his Paul Allen sold his 60 pieces. Technically speaking, 60 pieces of shit on his wall. It's a lovely auction at Christie's, by the way. I don't mean to be, mm -hmm. I don't mean to belittle it. I'm just going to say that that was $1.5 billion or 12% of, of what it took to be the richest man on the planet 27 years prior. He had that hanging on his wall, which leads someone like me to say, well, gee, I wonder how many billionaires actually are working right now at Microsoft. Turns out the number's 20. Mm -hmm. You know, how many people are worth, are worth over 100 million, but not yet a billionaire? Turns out that number is like 50. And so what does that do to the price of a Birkin bag at Hermes? Well, it takes it down to zero. <laughs> it's a zero. And, and you're you're seeing that reflected in uh, you're seeing that reflected in LVMH stock and Bernard Arnault. You're seeing that uh, you know you're seeing that in um, Ferrari as we were talking about today. I mean, that's, if you look at the stock price, what's the what is the cost of a Ferrari today? Well, it's nothing. Well, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Well, nothing to these gentlemen, but a lot but to the rest. It's of not the just these gentlemen. It's a it's a tsunami of these people that are flooding the world now, and 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 they are not. There's just nothing to do, my friend. There's and, and, and you know when when I talk about the Overton window, those things that you cannot speak about. I mean, I can ask, and I have friends of mine that will still push back on this. Okay. So I will I will ask, I said, OK, so especially when they start moaning about the federal deficit. I mean, I hear this all the time and uh, federal deficits at all time high. It's really terrible. And, and it's OK. So I, how's how how's your equity? How the stock market? Is it at an all time? Well, yeah. Well, how about that house of yours? Has, uh, yeah. Well, uh, there is a correlation. There is a donkey and there's a cart. And the donkey is the federal deficit, and the cart is all the stuff I own, including my stocks and my real estate. So I want the federal deficit to be as high as possible. They can't print enough of that money to upset me. 
So, but you can't have that conversation with anyone, even though the correlation is clear. And if you doubt it, try finding a chart or anyone on CNBC on any given day that has a chart that shows the S&P 500 alongside the federal deficit. You won't see it because it's outside the Overton window. You can't have that conversation. Can't do it. Can't do it. And, and uh, you know, who do you tell about? Nobody. You just pick up the money. Just I'll, I'll just take the money. Anyway, sorry well, about that again. That's how I think about it. No, but uh, you've piggybacked uh, these ideas onto some very successful trades. And I guess two of them, in particular, NVIDIA has just you just hit it. You just hit it out of the park with NVIDIA. You call that one in spades and it sounds I like didn't, I, did, I, I, I didn't i didn't call i did not i did not i did not okay mm. on may the on may the 25th 26th or 27th jensen wong said hey y'all looks like we got an extra seven billion dollars that just happened and so all I did was ask a simple question, where did $7 billion come from? And once I understood, and I sort of subliminally knew where $7 billion came from, but I just think it's a reasonable thing to ask when $7 billion shows up, especially when the last eight quarters of the, the revenue averaged $6.8 billion a quarter, and all of a sudden these guys go to, you know, what's well, going to be $7 billion extra next quarter, and then... And then you start understanding the, the the fact that it's not possible for a company to compete against NVIDIA. You may want to do it, but it's not possible. It's impossible for that to happen. It's a it's a it's a closed group, and you ain't in it. And right. and that. You, you, that's it. That's there is nothing else that's going on, and the same is true is true for Tesla. The same is it, it's a closed group, and you ain't in it. Because let's think about what these companies make: commodities, full commodities. There is nothing that Nvidia makes that any number of company can't make tomorrow. There is legions of companies that make EVs right now. As, as I've said in several of my emails, in, uh, Tesla will be, BYD sold more EVs than Tesla did in, in Q4. Well, if you think BYD is gonna sell a lot of Teslas, I mean, wait till you see what Huawei and Xiaomi is about to do. Tesla's not even going to be in the top five in the next 365 days from now, which is why we're buying every share we can get our hands on, because it's commodity. Well, that's, there's nothing well, that's special there. If there that's was something special, it, I wouldn't be able to buy the stock. Anyway, it's a, again. It's an interesting interesting statement that Tesla is going to see a lot of competition, but you're trying to buy every share of it. Every Show me a company whose product is going to zero and I will buy every share I can get my hands on. If it's good, if, if they're, if they're able to raise their prices, I don't want to touch it. But if I know it's going to zero, I want to own every share. For example, what do we, what do we think the H 100s are trading at right now with a huge discount right now, H 200s right now. We, we already know that the market's flooded with them. So we knew that, as did everyone, that the you you know this uh, the price of these things they don't go lower they go to zero. <laughs> well, <laughs> they, most people would say most, most people would say Tesla. People would worry that Tesla will not have enough volume as the price declines. And I think your view is, as the price declines, it'll have a lot more volume, right? People completely miss the story, in my opinion, because the story is not Tesla necessarily. It's the batteries. I could let me just think about this. Think about this. Uh, who owns BYD? Obviously, it's Buffett. He was a big holder of BYD early on in 2008. OK, right. well, what else does he own in that? What, what else does he own? OK, well, who owns who owns Duracell? What's Warren Buffett? Batteries. <laughs> Who owns Ever Ready? Well, they ain't Warren Buffett. So you've got an oligopoly. So you got five companies right now that make probably all of the batteries globally right now. LG, CATL, LG Chem, um, SG, Panasonic, which is, you know, um, 
obviously, and that's it. <clears throat> and and here's the big deal. Here's the reason this is the biggest story I've ever seen. In, I, I am about to witness the biggest wealth transfer in history. And why is that? It's really simple because everything on the periodic table can be infinitely recycled. So the last time somebody bought a gallon of gasoline, drove 25 miles, and then recycled that gallon of gasoline was never. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's, ne it's never happened. Zach... Runs the fund, obviously. You you mm -hmm. heard me. You talked to Zach. Right. Zach Zach bought a Tesla in two thousand. That battery that he bought will, will still be used in in two thousand twenty two hundred and twenty four hundred. So it, it, it's in, it's inconceivable that somebody would say, well. Well, they're going to recycle that battery. Well, yeah, just like they recycle ships, just like they recycle steel and I-beams, they're going to be recycling Zach's battery in, a, in 30 years, in 60 years, in 100 years, because it's the same molecules. But what they won't be doing is using gasoline. It's not going to happen. Ship is sailed. And so people say, well, I think gasoline, I, you're used to telling me oil is going away. And I, well, of course it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course it is. I mean, why would it not be going away? Okay, so um, yeah, they're still going to use it for other things, but sixty percent of every every barrel of oil goes to transportation and driving cars. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's unbelievable, and all of that wealth is going to transfer to me. Remember, <laughs> I say it all the time. I don't actually care about anybody else. It comes to me. So well. Well, most of that wealth is going to the Trillionaire Club. I guess you're going to join the Trillionaire Club at some no, point. No, I'm not right? going to join. You know, I don't even care. I mean, I just don't even care. It's all so, it's all so absurd. But what, what, what's interesting, the most interesting thing about this is how unbelievably impossible it is to have this conversation with normal adults. You cannot do it. I have friends in, in California, for example, I have friends in California who just they just do not believe they simply cannot believe that that EVs will be 100 percent of every new car sale in 2035. Even though that's even though that's the law, that's actually really even though that's the law. the law, right? Even though even though that's the law, and I'll, I'll tell you something else. I'll tell you something else, and, and this is really astounding to me that that again I don't even understand how this is not just so obvious. 2023, at year in 2023, almost 20% of every new car that was sold in 2023 did not have a gas tank. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> I, I don't, how is it possible that, that people struggle with that notion? You have to sort of think about the time lags. I and mean, I think about the time lags a lot. For example, why did I miss why did I miss completely the Apple story? I completely missed it. Well, I, I missed it because it happened so fast because the ASP was what a thousand dollars. Right. So right. by 2015, I still had my Blackberry. Well, 2016, it was over with. Right. Peak, peak iPhone sales in 2016. So if you think about Norway, who is probably one of the most aggressive in the world, um, I think 90% of every new car sale in 2023 was an EV. And, and even if you drive around in Norway, 30% of every car you pass on the highway is still gasoline powered because it's, it's going to take... 13 to 12 to 13 years for all of these cars to get junked and taken off the highway. But it's not the actual idea like that that interests me. I'm not even interested about the money. What interests me is how difficult it is for people to have this conversation when all they have to do is spend a little bit of time and think about it just for a minute. And, you know, that's. That's what I'm fascinated by. That's what I'm fascinated by. And, 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 and I spend a lot of time reading books 
by people who have been doing this for years. Leo Zillard, for example, H.G. Wells, for example, um, Ted Kaczynski, for example. I mean, there's a lot of people that have been, you know, telling these things very clearly, Arthur Clarke and, and, uh, and Kubrick, I mean, I just reread 2001 A Space Odyssey, I guess, two months ago. It's unbelievably shocking how prescient that is. <laughs> it's just kidding. You can't. As a matter of fact, you even have you even have a uh, a uh, Parmigiano sh- sh- uh, grater that I gave Lee. You remember? Right. You know, the, the tall one, you still have it? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, I, Okay, well, why do you think that's in your ass right now? Because of Richard Sapper. That was designed by Richard Sapper. Richard Sapper is the guy that designed the IBM ThinkPad. That little thing in the middle is the HAL 9000, that little red dot, that little red dot that, that's at the end of the Tizio lamp. That's Richard Sapper. That's that whole set of people who think about these things and are and they know it's coming. It's not like they're... They're hiding it. They know it's coming. That's why I'm spending all the time on the H5N1 virus right now. It's coming. Everybody knows it's coming. Everybody knew the SARS, the pandemic was coming because because uh, Obama halted uh, that you know gain of function research in 2014. Ron Fouchier recreated uh, the uh, H5N1 virus. <laughs> we got to stop this. So. Everything, all of these things are perfectly predictable. Elon Musk being a trillionaire is perfectly predictable. All EVs, every new car sale being an EV in 2035 is perfectly predictable. How is it possible not to predict that? <laughs> that's my point. That's why I, that's what I do. How is it possible to conclude anything other in 2007 when I was offered a job at a value of zero that I had, that that was exactly what my worth and experience was. There's no other conclusion. <laughs> okay. Okay. There you go. Well, I, well, you're, you're probably pretty, you're probably pretty happy at this point that you didn't end up being stuck in a corporate job because it certainly allowed you to do a lot of free thinking, right? For the last one. You know, it was it David Foster Wallace said when somebody asked him one time, you know, how, how'd you get to know so much? And he said, so I read the books. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I read the books uh, because I can read the books. Uh, I have the time. I read the books, you know, and and I'm not everybody in my little crowd reads the books. You read the books. You know, Zach reads the books. My son, my kids read the books. Everybody reads the books. So, so is it nice? Of course, it's, it's lovely. So let me ask you one last question, because you are saying your portfolio is pretty much two stocks, Tesla and NVIDIA. And I guess moving uh, yes, it is, my stocks, friend. Right. But th- what would you say to someone that says, look, that's that's very that's like the opposite of being diversified, right? Tesla and NVIDIA, that's like the total opposite of being diversified. Now, they're actually probably well, not I, correlated. I was... They're probably not correlated, interestingly enough. I haven't done David, those numbers. Look, it's really, it's, no, they're not correlated. There is no correlation. Uh, David Krakauer, the head of the Santa Fe Institute, um, he, has a, he, has a, he has a saying, and he, you hear him sometimes in some of his lectures. I'm a big fan of the Santa Fe Institute because, because that's where uh, Cormac McCarthy was a fellow. And, right. uh, you know, I'm, you know all, all he did was write a book about the – SARS pandemic called the plague, but other than that, but Krakow has a uh, Krakow has a has a saying. He's it's a saying. What if I propose the game that you could not lose? Okay, would would you play it? And the answer is no. No one wants to play it. So I'm sixty six years old. There has never been a time in my adult life when the S&P 500 has not been making all-time highs, regardless of the president, regardless of whatever's going on globally, my entire adult life, the S&P 500 has always been making new highs. 
Right. In my entire adult life, there's always only been monopolies making those new highs. You didn't have to be a discerning investor in 1955 to try to pick out which oil stock you should buy. It didn't take a lot of thinking, okay? You just you bought any of them. Any, anyone would do because you also knew what the population was going to be. And population correlates to GDP growth. So it's not hard, okay? And so... And so so then you think about the other correlate. Well, what is that? Well, it's a federal deficit. Well, there's never been a time in my entire adult life where the federal deficit's not making an all-time high. As a matter of fact, the Congressional Budget Office puts out a paper every every year where they project what the federal deficit's going to be in 10 years. So I know what the federal the federal debt held by the public, I know exactly what that number is going to be in 2034. And the reason I know that is because the Congressional Budget Office tells me. So I don't, there's nobody doing any thinking around here is my point, okay? There's not nobody. It's going to be up 84%, and the correlation between the, between the federal deficit or the public debt held by the public and the S&P 500 is it's just it's right there. And they got this new thing called the Google, and you can Google it, and you can see it yourself. And you can even but, chat GBT, and then chat GBT will write the essay for you. Exactly. Right. So I'm sitting here playing a game I can't lose. I've got the I've got every government on the planet. I've got China that already stated it's 100 percent of EVs by 2035. There's this place called the EU, the second largest car market in the world, also mandated it. And then you've got every state in the in the U. You know, every state, but they'll gradually get there. And then I'm yeah. living in a country where where what 30. 30, what is it, uh, 25 to 30 percent of every kilowatt hour of electricity by source in the state of Texas, the home of oil and gas, is from wind and solar? I, said, I don't, so of course I'm going to have every every dime I have in, in, in a stock that's going to participate in this transition, this global transition from petroleum to, from petroleum to lithium and iron, these LFP batteries, lithium, F, which is ferro, iron, and then P for phosphate. <laughs> yeah, why, why, why would I? And by the way, you know, let's let's not. Uh, cons- people ask me all the time, well, what about the stock? What about the volatility, for example? And I'm always, well, let's see. You, you're talking about the one that's up 100x since it came public. Is that the one you're talking about? <laughs> you're worried about that one? Okay. And, and, and so you can clearly see that Tesla is reflecting that tra- that wealth transition that that, that that is and it's just now accelerating is one of the reasons I'm so enthusiastic there is because it's accelerating. I don't know who said it, but, uh, you know, put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket. Well, that's what I do. But I do, I do believe I'm playing a game I can't lose. I just it's such, it's such an absurd notion to worry about geopolitical risk or or any of those things. There's you know I wake up every day and uh, you know as you know I'm I'm a keen virus watcher. I, I well, mean, you, I'm, but you you would feel the same and as strongly if uh, Elon Musk went to Mars and never returned to Earth. And gave up his position at Tesla, right? Uh, listen, I am not. Listen, I am not a fan of of though the only person, the only one of that class that I really adore. I mean, I really, I fundamentally, I fundamentally, I the only guy that I really think is really cool is Barry Diller. Okay, because Diller, because they all tell the same origin story. So they all, they, they all want to out compete each other about how poor they were, and right. Um, Right. But Dealer will say he can't help himself. OK, but he'll sit and he'll say on CNBC, you'll see him every now and then he'll say, you know, my first job was working in the mailroom at Disney. And um, mm-hmm. he says, yeah, but I, I live next door to the Disney, though. But he <laughs> he, he throws that one out. And um, but Musk is a different Musk is a different guy. I mean, I think his aspirations are infinitely more. Um, I think his aspirations are a lot more. um grim let's say than um 
than just going to Mars and saving the world. I mean, I just, uh, I think, um, and by the way, let's give credit where credit's due. I mean, what, what he says, what he says is that, uh, you know, we need a backup planet. Well, why do we need a backup planet? Well, we need a backup planet for exactly the reasons that, that we, the, the, the whole population just suffered through this, uh, this SARS pandemic that only killed what, say 20 million people globally. So uh, the, these things are not going to stop. They're, they're just not going to stop. I mean, and, and plus, they're so bloody profitable. I mean, there's no reason to think anyone wouldn't want another global pandemic. I was what is it created some 50 new organic billionaires that never existed before. So it's not no original thinking going on. I can promise you that none zero. Let me let me end the conversation of this part with something to wonder about, which is, is critical thinking generally lapsing now that we have chat GBT, Gemini and other AI tools that bring at your fingertips some modicum of information that looks as though it's thought out whether or not it's thought out or not do you worry about that at all no i would propose that that's how i actually make my money okay i, I actually think that that um the very last thing i need or want is critical thinking and and and, and it's it's extraordinary to me that 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 I live in a world that, I mean, let's stop and think about 1995 when I was working for another investment bank and, you know, calling on clients, pan Europe, primarily in Italy. And, um, and, and all of these things that I'm reading now and all of these things that I get to tap into weren't available to me in 1995. You would say, well, well, Pat, that's, not, that's actually not true because they were, you, the books were there and you could have, no, the books weren't there. Okay, you had, in 1995, you actually had to be in the club. You had to be at Stanford. You had to be in Princeton. You had to be at MIT. You had to be at Caltech. You, you didn't know what to read. You didn't have access to these people. And so by, by 2007 and 2008, I would... I have often said that the price of stupidity went through the roof mm -hmm. because you became because all of this information became incredibly available. And 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 so you just have to do a little bit of logical thinking and, and to be able to sort of question like you and I are having these emails and these conversations about uh, about this uh, avian flu in cows. And, and you said, to us, well, let's hang on a second. So only American female cows. Does that make sense? OK, uh, so it's cow food. Does that make sense? Maybe cows are passing it. Mm -hmm. And so, so then you go to other countries and you check the experiences in other countries and then you suddenly realize, well, hang on a second. There's there are things inside of this inside of this situation that's not adding up. I mean, why am I to believe, for example, that China did a horrific job with the pandemic? Oh my God, they were amazing. Much better job than any other country on the planet. Unbelievable the job that China did. So I spend my time paying attention to what China's doing relative to anything in this sort of realm. And, um, and so it, it it amazes me. It, it it absolutely amazes me that this level of disinformation, and I'm not going to call it dif disinformation because I, I I'm not sitting on top of all the answers. But but I I'm going to ask a couple of obvious questions. Tune in next time on the Valley Current.